You know, the recurrence for the sum m is a certificate for the correctness of the recurrence for the sum, by which I mean that you don't have to take the computer's word for it that it correctly found the recurrence, or that the, the sum satisfies the recurrence that the computer claims it satisfies, because this thing certifies it in the sense that a human can be called so That is to say, the sum and recurrence certifies the identity because if it's trivial to prove the sum and recurrence, that's easy. Yeah. And then second, it's also trivial to prove that the sum and recurrence implies the sum recurrence, just sum over k. That's all there is to it. So those two steps are trivial, for which the professional word is polynomial ten. And that's how it's done. Now, uh, <coughs> the general theorem, still with functions of one variable, is well, one summation variable, is that a proper hypergeometric term always satisfies a recurrence that looks like this. This is the summand recurrence. In general, it looks like that. Um, and I'll show you what it looks like in two variables. There are two summation variables. In this uh, recurrence, capital case of k is forward shift in little k, and r is some rational function that the computer tells you about, tells you exactly what it is. So the theorem is, for every proper hypergeometric term, and I won't say that exactly what that is, please see A equals B, um, satisfies, everyone satisfies such a recurrence. Okay, now let's go to two dimensions, which is where we're going to live for this particular problem. Now we have f of n, r, and s, in which n is a running variable, r and s are the two summation indices. Okay, so it's a function of three variables, one, two of which are summation indices. Um, the general theorem in this case says that f of n r s satisfies a recurrence, which on the left hand side looks like that. On the right hand side, uh, you have a forward shift with respect to the index r minus 1, and here's a forward shift with respect to the index s minus 1, acting on uh, two different rational functions and multiple multiplied by f of n k. So this is the form of the recurrence that a proper hypergeometric term in two summation variables satisfies. And the question is to find it, find out all these c sub 0, c1, and so on. But that's what the algorithm does. Well, I think I just said that. <coughs> so in the case of the coin toss, here's the summation, the summand, pardon me, <coughs> summand is this. And we want to find that recurrence for this summand. Okay. So we go into Zauberger's algorithm, which is available in Maple, from his website. Now it returns the following recurrence for the sum n. I must emphasize the sum, the sum sign is missing up here, just the sum n. So you find that g of n plus 1 r and s minus x plus 1 y plus 1 g of n r and s, and I'll say what x and y are in a moment, <coughs> is the forward shift operator minus 1 times sum. Break it, you mean P and Q? Do I mean P and Q? X no, I mean X and Y. I'll, okay, I'll say what they are right now. X is P over 1 minus P, and Y is Q over 1 minus Q. Thank you. Thanks for the comment. Uh, <coughs> anyway, forward shift operator minus 1 acting on some function of N, R, and S times G, which is now G, plus the same thing in S over here. Um, so it returns a recurrence that looks like that. <coughs> In which x p over one minus p, etc., and the two c's that are in there are given by c one equals what it says there, and c two equals what it says there. So there is a recurrence for the sum n that occurs in this coin toss problem. It is, I should say, it's one. It's a recurrence for the following property that if in a million years I could never have found this recurrence by hand. <laughs> But it can be proved once you know it. Uh, you can prove the recurrence for the sum that comes from it. Well, human beings can do it. Of course, the would think that's a terrible way to find the machine already did it. <laughs> Why bother? OK. Anyway. Uh, now, we sum over R and S. Now, when we do sum over R and S, uh, things are a little trickier in two variables than they were in one. Here, for instance, what we're doing so we're summing over R and S to find a recurrence for the sum, <coughs> as opposed to a recurrence for the summand. 
Okay, so this is the analog of summing over k in the one variable problem. When you sum over R nets, you find yourself summing over something like that. Um, in the one variable case, these sums all usually turn out to be zero because the summands have contact support. They vanish outside of some interval, like n choose k vanishes outside of the interval zero to n, for instance. But here things are a little trickier because the sum over, over let's see, the sum over s will have some telescoping here because this is a forward difference minus the function. It's like f of r plus 1 minus f of r, and f of s plus 1 minus f of s. So it's a telescoping sum as far as the s is concerned, but it's not telescoping here. And it turns out after the smoke clears that this is the operative identity, and this is true for any function phi of convex support. So that's just a little technical point. So when you sum over r and s, the recurrence for the sum in, you need to use a couple of things like that. Thank you, Brian. Discrete version of green four. Discrete version of green four. Okay, yes. Um, and the bottom line is that the recurrence that f of n satisfies, f of n is now the sum. Okay, it's the actual probability that we saw a graph of in the slide. f of n satisfies this recurrence right here. And I'll say what phi sub n is on the next slide. It's something explicit. Um, but the really nice feature of this that really surprised me was that the recurrence involves f of n plus 1 minus f of n. And so whatever that stuff is on the right-hand side, if it's positive, the function f is still increasing. And if it's negative, the function f is going down. So we're going to learn something about the peak that that function has by looking at whatever that right side is. That was the good news. Now let me show you what the right side is. <laughs> Okay. The phi n of z is the polynomial degree n whose coefficients are the squares of the binomial coefficients. And that's the polynomial which is, in fact, the Legendre polynomial, evaluated at 1 plus z over 1 minus z and multiplied by 1 minus z to the power n. That is exercise 3 million or so in Polyon Sigur, Aufgaben and Lair's and Halster analysis. It's a very nice fact about Legendre polynomials. So there's the polynomial whose coefficients are the squares of the binomial function. It's basically a, some kind of shifted Legendre polynomial. <coughs> so that's what phi n of z is. <coughs> if you look at the expression on the right-hand side there, you see that what's happening is the following. That Alice's probability will increase for just those values of n for which phi n plus 1 of xy over phi n of xy is less than or equal to 1 plus x plus 2. Why? Okay, it increases for those n, and it'll decrease if that inequality is reversed. So the problem is, to find the proof, first of all, that there's only one such n, which is true. There's only one n for which um, this uh, uh, left side exceeds, well, sorry, passes through the right-hand side, let's put it that way. As n increases, the left-hand side increases steadily, it turns out. And it is equal to the right-hand side, either at some n or between two consecutive values of n. And after that, it's larger than the right hand side. That's what happens. So, what we want to prove is that phi n plus 1 over phi n is a monotone function of n, where the phi's are these translated or whatever mangled Legendre polynomials. Okay? So, at least that's a nice problem in classical analysis. Okay, so the theorem is we're given probabilities p greater than q. The p plus q not equal to 1, by the way, I should say p plus q equals 1 um, is excluded here because it's easier. You can do everything. It's very explicit in that case. But the p plus q is not equal to 1. Then there are either 1 or 2 consecutive values of n such that f of n is greater than equal to f of n minus 1, and f of n plus 1 is less than equal to f of n, and at least one of those inequalities is strict. In other words, those three conditions say that the thing is unimodal as you expect it. Um, here are some bounds. If capital N of Q and P is the choice of N that maximizes the probability, the thing that turned out to be 26 on that several slides back, capital N is the one that maximizes the probability. Uh, the ties go into the lower value. Then the capital N of Q and P is greater than or equal to this. Uh, 